morning. Thank you, Lord, for your presence that we've already experienced. We thank you, Lord, that you'll continue to speak to our hearts. Amen. As we continue in the service this morning, giving honor and glory to you in the mighty name of Jesus. And everybody said, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Give the Lord a hand clap. Praise God. Amen. You may be seated. God bless you. Thank you, Tim, as always. Great job setting the tone for the service. And uh, Mike and Suzanne, as always, thank you guys for everything you're doing. And uh, welcome back, Don and Darlene. Praise the Lord. Great to see you guys again. Back to the beautiful, humid state of Iowa. Glory to God. Where air quality is zero this morning because of all the fireworks that went on last night. How about that? Praise the Lord. A little celebration and we suffer the next day for it. I remember that in my younger days. Praise the Lord. And uh, also, Yvette and Debbie. Glad to have you guys back too. Thought I caught you, didn't you? <laughs> no. We're grateful to have you guys back. I know Debbie had a, a little episode, but she's doing better. We're believing she's healed and whole. And God bless them for being here. And all of you. Appreciate y'all being here this morning. Amen. We're praying for Peter as well. He's getting overwhelmed with junk from work, and uh, they're putting him into weekend duty and all that stuff. But continue to pray for him that uh, the burden will be lifted and he can kind of get back to a, some sort of normal routine. Amen. So praise the Lord for that. Ron, great to see you back again. Amen. And uh, trust in the Lord. This is what we're all doing. Praise the Lord. And everybody out there on uh, Facebook and the cyber world, we appreciate you being a part of the service as well. We're grateful to have you uh, be with us. Amen. And as we say all the time, there is no distance in God. And so geographically, we may be separated, but in the spirit, we are all one. And we appreciate that. It blesses us to have you there uh, participating in the services with us. So God bless you all. Praise the Lord. Amen. Great to be in church, praise God. I see so many churches are still uh, shut down and just doing the uh, virtual thing, which is good. I mean, it's, you got to have it, but it's a shame that there aren't more uh, able to open the doors and get back to a little bit more of a normal kind of way of uh, having church. Praise the Lord. Absolutely. Yeah, we, and we love having you here. And that's the truth. I mean, that's why it says, uh, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together. We know wherever God is, there's a majority. So we know that we can deal with this outside of the church. But there's still something about brothers and sisters in the Lord coming together and how it magnifies the Lord. And it, it, it can't be duplicated. I'm sorry, but praise the Lord for that. Uh, God knows. And he's strengthening. And I believe we're moving towards the day when we'll all be back to church together. Amen. And doing things. Uh, by the Spirit, praise the Lord. So, in the meantime, I've got a little uh, recipe for you guys. <clears throat> How many of you like Caesar salad? I love Caesar salad, but then I like anchovies. So, you know, I saw the look on Darlene's face. Apparently, she's not into anchovies. That's the only reason Sally and I have been able to stay together these many years, is uh, we both like anchovies. <laughs> but you know how you can make any, any salad a Caesar salad? You stab it 23 times. A2 Brute, you know, praise the Lord. I asked uh, Peter this. Uh, he texts me back and forth with these uh, puns and stuff every once in a while. I'll get one from him. But I asked him this one the last time I got one from him. I said, what's the best time to go to the dentist? 2.30. Okay. I'm going to move up to a little more intellectual level. Why did Mozart kill all of his chickens? Well, he asked them who the best composer was, and they said, Ah, bah, bah. <laughs> They're not going to get any better. You know that, so praise the Lord. But here's for, I mean, with all this disruption and everything, there are people uh, that are going to be going back out looking for different jobs, better jobs, hopefully, and, and new jobs. So the key, I have did a little research on this, but the key to job searching is looking deep within yourself because it's all about the interview. Praise the Lord. Okay, well, you've been good. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Let's go to Matthew. We're going to open this uh, with Matthew chapter 24 and verse 14. Matthew 24 
and verse 14. Praise the Lord. This gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. It's what we were talking about in the preliminaries, and uh, so it, it's only fitting that the Holy Spirit would put this on my heart as well. We're all at one in the Holy Ghost, right? So this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. I want you to notice something. It's the gospel of the kingdom that's going to be preached to the whole world, not just religion. And then the end comes. Praise God. So let's go then to Daniel chapter 7 and verse 18. Daniel 7 and 18. But the saints of the Most High shall take the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, even forever and ever. Verse 22. Until the Ancient of Days came, and judgment was given to the saints of the Most High, and the time came that the saints possessed the kingdom. Verse 27. And the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High, whose kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and all dominions shall serve and obey Him. Praise the Lord. So this gospel won't be preached or demonstrated by just a few big name preachers or ministries. But it's mainly the saints who are going to take the kingdom message and ministry to all the world. And we don't have to go to Europe or to France or you know to, to the Middle East or wherever to do it. They the people the saints there will be doing the same thing we're doing here and that is reaching the people that we can reach, the people we work with, just as Tim has said, the people that we meet at the grocery store or when we're shopping, our family members, our neighbors, just the people that we would automatically have access to. That's how this gospel gets spread to the whole world. Amen? And it happens all around the world. Praise the Lord. So it's mainly the saints who are going to take this kingdom message and ministry to all the world. Look, if you look at, uh, if we can go back to Daniel uh, verse 18 again of chapter 7. The saints of the Most High shall take the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, even forever and ever. So it's the saints of the Most High who take the message and possess, or in other words, demonstrate the kingdom forever. So everybody can see Jesus demonstrated as king over everything. Praise the Lord. The domains of the earth and all the dominions will serve and obey God. Amen. And the end result will be the fulfillment of Daniel 2 and verse 44. And in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. Uh, Revelation 11 and verse 15. And I used this scripture last week, uh, but it's still appropriate because it's in the same context here that we're speaking of this morning. And the seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven saying, The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord. And of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. The literal translation of that is the kingdoms of this world become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his anointed, which is the church. Yes. Praise the Lord. So the kingdoms of this world become the kingdoms of God and his children, yes. his saints. Praise the Lord. So let me say this. We think in terms of uh, confessing the word, and we talk about it a lot because it's biblical. But this is the way that God is going to usher in this last day. You are the prophet of your own life. Yes. I mean, you are speaking blessing or cursing, amen, not only to those around you or to the situations and circumstances, but to yourself personally, amen? So, speaking, uh, you know, saying prof being prophetic, in other words, one way is just preaching the Word of God. That's prophecy. That's one way of prophesying. But there's also... It's speaking under the influence of the Holy Spirit to declare or predict by the influence of divine guidance or the Word of God. That's true prophecy. And that's why Jesus said, 
if anybody comes in and they're prophesying and they're not prophesying edification, uplifting, encouragement, then it's not true prophecy. Because if you read this Bible with knowledge of God's goodness and love, you're going to find there isn't any fear in this. It's all about God providing for every need that we have. Amen. Protection and provision and all that. So if we're going to prophesy, we need to be saying what God says. And that's, I believe, where God is bringing us into these last days, where we're moving from just hearing the Scriptures, but actually sharing the Scriptures with everybody else. And it doesn't have to be a literal uh, word for word, but we have to give the same principles and the same truths, amen, to the people that we come into contact so that they can be brought to God. So that, See, I, I had a, uh, some family and stuff we were with the other day. They're believers, but kind of nominal, you know. And I'm, I'm not saying this in a negative way. I'm just saying... And I, I, I got home afterwards, and we were just having fun, having a good time. And anybody that knows me knows I'm not overly religious, but I do like to share what God's doing in my life and what he wants to do for others. And I felt a little funny about it. I thought, maybe I should have said something. Because we, we were talking about different ways that people worship and how they uh, follow after the Lord. And the Lord spoke to me uh, yesterday after, uh, when I was praying, and he said, let the Holy Spirit lead you. In other words, you can go and try to force something on people, but if the Holy Spirit isn't dealing with them, you're just button heads. So you, you share what you can share, what, what's shareable, you know what I'm saying, and then give that time. Let the Holy Spirit use that to work with them and to draw them closer. Then the next time you get to be with them, you might find other doors open up. Doors that wouldn't open up the first time begin to open. Why? Because now it's not just you trying to get them to agree with you. It's the Holy Spirit drawing them to Jesus. Amen. It's the Holy Spirit trying to bring them into a deeper understanding and relationship with God. So we need to, we need to be mindful. And that's what I mean by being led for, by the Holy Spirit. It's never wrong to share the gospel with anybody. But there are ways to do it that can be more profitable than others. I mean, we've learned in the past that sometimes you just go out and beat on somebody's door and hand them a track doesn't always work. It, it can irritate people more than it can draw them to God. So we need to be praying about the people that we come into contact with and be listening to the voice of the Lord when he says, this is somebody you can talk to right now, right? And others who you just kind of got to ease into it, whereas others are wide open. They're, they're ready for anything that God has for them. So that's what I mean by being led by the Holy Spirit. I'm not saying be a, a afraid or intimidated, but let the Spirit lead you so you can have the biggest impact that God wants to have on that individual's life. Praise the Lord. Let's look at this in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 10. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Now we've always read that and thought that, well, that's almost like an Old Testament prayer because it was still when Jesus was here. But Jesus is telling us, he went about preaching the kingdom of God. And he's telling us that that's our challenge, is to bring the kingdom here. Amen? Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Well, another way of saying that would just simply be, let what is invisible become visible. What we can't see should be seen. And the only way that can happen is by the children of God revealing it, releasing it. Amen? Re through words and through acts, through prayer, through laying on of hands, whatever it might be. Amen? And so look at Luke here, uh, Luke chapter 14, and we'll read verses 16 through 23. Luke 14 and verses 16 through 23. <clears throat> then said he unto him, A certain man made a great supper and bade many. And he sent his servant at supper time to say to them that were bidden, Come, for all things are now ready. And they all, with one consent, began to make excuse. The first said unto him, I have bought a piece of ground, and I must needs go see it. I pray thee, have me excused. Another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen, and I go to prove them. I pray thee, have me excused. Another said, I have married a wife, therefore I cannot come. So that servant came and showed his Lord these things. And then the master of the house, being angry, said to his servants, Go out quickly into the streets and lanes of the city, and bring in hither the poor, the maimed, the halt, and the blind. And the servant said, Lord, it is done as thou hast commanded, and yet there is room. And the Lord said unto the servant, Go out into the highways and hedges and compel them to come in, that my house may be filled. So in this parable, amen, of the great supper, Jesus is revealing the last days. He's revealing a worldwide revival, amen, that will be saints going out into the highways and byways, compelling people to come in by convincing them of supernatural gifts, 
amen, of the Holy Spirit, amen, so that Christ's house or the church, amen, will be filled. Praise the Lord. And I believe that's the day we're in. We're beginning to see that this isn't about how many people you can get in a tent, how many people you can get into a church building, but it's how many people your personal life can impact, amen, just going out in the highways and byways where we go every day on the way to work, to the grocery store, to Walmart, to wherever it might be, to our neighborhood, amen. This is what God is saying in the last days, amen. We can do this because we don't have to have this vision of something I'm going to have to go to 50 different countries, amen, to do what God wants done. No, I just need to do what He has made available for me right here and right now. And if we all do that, we're going to have this worldwide impact, amen, that God and the Holy Spirit is declaring will be the last days. Praise the Lord. Amen. So Romans chapter 1, verses, uh, verse 17. Romans 1, 17. Praise the Lord, for therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Chapter 5, verse 1. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. The reason I'm reading these scriptures is because when I first came to the Lord, there were all kinds of things you had to do. And what God has been revealing in these last days, and we would think we'd know this because Martin Luther discovered this, you know, uh, the just shall live by faith, praise the Lord, uh, hundreds of years ago, and yet the church has continued to be about what we got to do and what we don't have to do instead of it's about faith. And this is the message God is trying to get to the world because that's the only thing that's going to save them. Because they'll never be good enough for God to accept them on their own terms. None of us have been. It's about what Jesus has already done, the finished work of Christ. So he says, by, by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Amen? Praise God. Titus 3, uh, verses 5 through 9. The thing is, it, t it takes us out of the picture in terms of us trying to force something onto people or get them to believe or get them to do. When we show them the love of God and we show them how God really wants to uh, impact their lives by them just trusting Him. This is what Tim talks about every Sunday in different ways. It's, it's really just about trusting God and thanking God for what He's done for us. That opens the door to everything. And if people who have not had a relationship with God could understand that, it would make it all totally different. It would no longer be about, well, you know, I've got all these problems. You know, I, I have this issue, and I still do this, and I have that, and I don't do this. And, and hey, tap the brakes, man. This is what God has done for you. The, the other stuff can be taken care of. Seek first the kingdom of God, His righteousness, not yours, His, and all this stuff gets added to it. All this stuff gets taken care of. So it's not by works of righteousness, which we have done. But according to His mercy, He saved us by the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Ghost, which He shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior, that being justified by His grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. This is a faithful saying, and these things I will that thou affirm constantly, that they which have believed in God might be careful to maintain God works. These things are good and profitable unto men. But avoid foolish questions and genealogies and contentions and strivings about the law, for they are unprofitable and vain. Well, if we should avoid it, then we should certainly avoid sharing those kinds of things with people who do not know the Lord. Amen? Luke 5, 37. So don't put new wine into old wineskins. No man putteth new wine into old bottles, else the new wine will burst the bottles and be spilled, and the bottles shall perish. So here's what I believe the Holy Spirit is saying to me. We know that we can't put new restoration truth and experience into an old denominational mindset, not with their doctrines, that are set like cement, and all of us have been in these churches, and I'm not criticizing the churches, I'm saying they've done, they're just doing what they know to do. But God is trying to get us, give us a wake-up call here, because it, that is not going to work in these last days. We have to reach people at the level they're at. We can't come to them with a, a rule book 
and tell them this is this follow these rules. No, it's about here's God and he loves you and he wants to lead you and guide you into all truth. Praise the Lord. And so, amen. Uh, they've got doctrines. They've got, uh, I mean, it's like set in cement. They're articles uh, of acceptable Christian uh, experience and practices. They're just as dry and just as hard and non-adjustable as an old dried goat skin, amen, that had old wine in it for years and years. Amen. And for that reason, most restoration movements, and I just think about this, start in some insignificant place, some obscure location. Amen. I could, I could just go down the list, whether it's all the way back to Calvinism or, you know, Protestantism or the Pentecostal movement or the charismatic movement or any other. They've all started in some place where nobody had heard of until after the fact. Amen. And that's how God works. And it's, it's based on the first truth that we see uh, concerning that. Amen. Because Jesus, who headed the church movement, the new covenant. Amen. Where was he born? New York, New York, Paris. Amen. No, he was birthed in a stable in this little town of Bethlehem. And out of the millions of people who were on the earth at that time, now there's billions, but at that time, millions of people that were on the earth, there were less than a dozen people who knew anything significant had even happened. Now we read it now and we think, oh, everybody was, no. There was a handful of people that knew. It was in some off the track, no place, kind of out of the way, little town. Amen. And it was 40 years later then that Luke records the birth of Jesus and made it a significant historical happening so that others could read about it. Amen. And I believe that established the pattern for birthing of future spiritual restorations within the church because everyone that I've just briefly spoke about happened in obscure, out of the way, unusual places. Amen. So a restoration movement progresses just like Jesus did from the cradle till he was 30 years old. He was only known by a few people until the fullness of time came and God decided now it's time to reveal. Right? So we think, well, you know, it can't happen here. Yeah, this is exactly the kind of place where it can happen, where it will happen. Not, I'm not saying just here, but in insignificant, as far as the world is concerned or religion is concerned, those are the kind of places that God loves to use because nobody gets the credit but God. They say, well, if, it, if you were going to do, if it was up to you, Nathan, you'd have done it 30 years ago, wouldn't you? Yeah, but it's not up to me. I can only do what I can do. It's up to God. It's up to the Holy Spirit to define the time. Jesus, he said, it's not my time yet. Remember when they asked him to, to do the miracle, to turn the water into wine? He says, it's not right yet. Well, God must have spoken to him, and he decides, okay, maybe this is the time. This is the time that God's going to begin to open doors and show his power, his love, his commitment to his people. Amen? So when God's time came for public proclamation, then the Jesus, or Messiah movement, you could call it back then, became a national issue. And it started causing conflict. It started causing confusion and controversy within the established religious world of Judaism. Amen? It's always, I mean, think about the, the Protestant Reformation. Man, it, it, it stirred up some crap in the religious world. And, of course, Jesus, there's no parallel to what he did in terms of bringing the truth to people who had been in bondage to religion. Not, they, had, they had messed it up. Amen? And so it's the same with every other religious movement. I, you think of uh, the Pentecostal movement. I started off somewhere in Europe and, and, and uh, uh, Wales or someplace over in there. When it comes to the United States, it's a, a few women in a prayer meeting in, in Kansas. I mean, come on. It wasn't like some major church. And then Azusa Street in a barn or some little shack, you know, in California. It spread, and it always was in these little, out of the way, inconspicuous, uh, kind of unexpected places. Amen? And so when God, when God begins to move, it creates confusion. It creates uh, controversy within the organized religion of the time. Because it's never, he, he comes and he's never quite like they expected him to come. Just as the first time he came. Born where he was born. Nobody would have thought this was God. This was God being manifest in the flesh. Because even the scripture, David talks about, surely he'll come on a white horse, you know, with a sword. And, you know, here he comes and, and declare his, his kingdom has come. You know, we're going to rule and reign here now. 
But that isn't the way God works. Isaiah chapter 40, verses 3 through 5. What God does is prophesy. And then it happens. Because his prophecy is truth. And that's why he's, I, I believe the prophetic movement and in, in the way we understand it today is the confession of the word. And I believe that's what ushers in this last day revival. When we start saying what God says, God starts showing up. Amen. The voice of him that crieth in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be exalted. Every mountain and hill will be made low. And the crooked shall be made straight. And the rough places plain. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed. And all flesh shall see it together. For the mouth of the Lord hath spoken it. Praise the Lord. Luke chapter 1 and verse 17. So Isaiah is prophesying the first coming of Christ. And then he talks about, this is uh, John the Baptist, right? And he shall go before him in the spirit and the power of Elijah, which we just read his prophecy, to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, the disobedient to the wisdom of the just, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Well, we are now that prophetic voice, amen, as John was for Jesus, we are now for Jesus to come again, amen. So we're, we're, we're dealing with the same, that's how God works. He, he, doesn't, he doesn't have a different, whole new, different plan. It's just we have to take the time to figure out what it is he's actually saying. We have to look at the prophetic words of God and see how that manifests in our particular time. Amen? And it's just a continuation. That's why we have, you read the scriptures and you find, okay, that's how God works. Well, that's how he's going to work. You just have to be patient. You just have to be looking for it and cooperate with it. Amen? And think about the scriptures. If the first are going to be last and the last are going to be first, then just maybe the last coming of Christ will be just like his first coming. Amen? And if that's true, then the church today ought to be excited. We ought to be, you know, on the edge of our seat, praise the Lord, because the generation that's alive now will come forth prophesying in the spirit of Elijah. Praise the Lord. We'll be the ones to see the second coming of Jesus. I'm not saying it's happening tomorrow, but I'm saying these are the last days, and that's what ushers it in. The same way he came the first time is the way he's coming the last time, and that means somebody's got to be speaking prophetically the word of God into that nation or into the, into the people that they come into contact with. Praise the Lord. Amen. God raised up Abraham to launch and establish the Jewish race, right? There were no Hebrews before Abraham. In fact, the word Hebrew comes from crossing over. He crossed over the river, and that's where that word comes from. And so he was the beginning. God raised him up to establish the Jewish race. How? By personal prophecy. I'm changing your name to Abraham. So every time Abraham spoke his name, he was prophesying. I'm the father of many nations. I'm not Abram. I'm Abraham. Now, do you think the people around him didn't mock him? Not probably to his face, because he was a powerful, wealthy man. But behind his back, I bet the servants were laughing. <laughs> Father of many nations. He doesn't have any kids. The one he's got's a bastard. By his, you know, concubine, or whatever you want to call it. Sure, but not, Abraham just kept prophesying. He just kept saying what God said. And I know people say today, oh, we've been hearing this all along. Of course, the Bible says they'll do that. We've been hearing this all of our life. Our grandparents heard it. Yeah, but someday... One day, it has to come to pass. And I believe it will come to pass the same way every other revolution and renovation and, and uh, restoration of God has ever taken place, and that's by prophecy. By the people who have contact with God begin to share what God is saying to the situation. Amen? So then, 5,000 years later, God raises up Moses to establish the dispensation of the law. And he did it by speaking prophetically what God had told him to say. To his chosen people. Right? Wasn't Moses didn't just walk out there and give him a speech. He said what God had said. He just simply repeated what God had told him. So he's prophesying to these people. Amen? But during the next 1500 years, Israel and their leaders allowed the ceremonial law and the tabernacle worship to become diluted, to, to be perverted. Amen? By misuse, by misinterpretation, and misapplication. Why? 
because everything in that law and everything in the tabernacle plan and the temple were to point to Jesus. And they never saw it. All they saw was the ritual. All they saw was the religion of it. And that's why when Jesus came, they didn't even recognize him. They didn't even know who he was. In fact, they fought against him. Look at Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 12. Now, I think it's interesting because it's so easy to look at Israel and see all their flaws. See where they missed it, why they didn't see this and why they didn't see that. But I want you to look at the history of the church. And I'm telling you, it is a mirror image of what Israel had. Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. 2 Peter 3, verse 15 through 17. And account that the long-suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul, also according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you, as also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest, as they do also the other scriptures unto their own destruction. Yet ye therefore, beloved, seeing ye know these things before, beware lest ye also, being led away with the error of the wicked, fall from your own steadfastness. So the true church began to be buried under the additions of religious men's ideas and traditions. Just the same as Israel. That's where the church was for 1,500 years. Amen? The same experience the Jews had. We started putting so much stuff, religious stuff, man-made traditions on top of what the Word said that we no longer we're focused on Jesus, we were focused on the rules. We were focused on the the, the regulations and how big the church be, how many people you could get in the church, all those kinds of things is what went on for 1,500 years. And they went directly away from what Jesus came to reveal. And we were caught up in the same mess that Israel was. Everything's pointing to Jesus and we're looking at religion instead of Jesus. And that's why prophecy will change everything. When we begin to share what the Word of God says to people, you're sharing Jesus. You're not sharing a religious attitude or idea or ideal even. You're sharing the God-man. Amen? The Savior, the Redeemer, the only one that can save them. The only thing that can save them. Amen? All the truth and, and supernatural experiences that the first century church believed and practiced They were lost. All you got to do is read the book of Acts to know something dramatic took place after that first century because you don't see it anymore. Now you just see religion on top of religion. Amen? And that's what Jesus prophesied. This thing deteriorated into an apostate church for the next thousand years. Yeah. Praise the Lord. That's what Jesus prophesied. That's what we're reading right here. we, We think this is something that's coming. No, this is something that's already happened. It already took place. Amen. For the next thousand years. That's why Jesus and the New Testament writers wrote it would develop in the church and it would be called a time of great falling away. I hear people still today saying, well, there has to come a falling away before Jesus can come. My God, man, look at the history. We've had a thousand years of falling away. It's about coming back. It's about a restoration that we're dealing with today. I'm not looking for a falling away. I've been looking at it ever since I've been alive. Amen. And if you read the history, you'll see it's been going on since that first century. Well, actually from about the third century probably. And then from that point on, you've got a thousand years of just apostasy. Everything but Jesus. Praise the Lord. Amen. And so that's what we call the Dark Ages. Because there was no revelation. There was no light. There was no God. Just religion. I mean, look at the history that was taking place there. You got wars and wars and constant wars and rumors of wars. What? About religion. This wasn't about nations so much as it was about religions. The Pope against the king. The king against this. Then them against the, the, the Reformation for the Protestant movement. And then within the Protestant movement, there was bickering and fighting over this and that and the other thing. It was all about religion. It, God got very little credit or, or re- revelation to people. Uh, all they were getting was more religion. Now think about this. A new race 
I don't care if you agree with me or not, go look it up for yourself, but here's what I'm thinking. A new race started every 2,000 years. Now, we're, 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 we're having issues with what is called racial issues. I don't believe it's racial issues at all. I believe it's spiritual issues. It just manifests itself in different ways, amen? And so uh, I'm not saying there haven't been injustices and so on and so forth. I'm just saying these things are manifesting in a way that instead of having inclusion, they create separation. And God was never about that. He never has been. It's always about inclusion. It's always about every, being one, amen? So think about this. A new race started every 2,000 years. That's God's timetable for mortal humanity. Praise the Lord. So it looks like it's been divided into three time periods to me. And each one of those time periods is approximately 2,000 years. So if you start with Adam and Eve being removed from the garden because they were eternal until they were taken out of the garden. And then they became mortal. Right? So when they, it's, the first one starts with Adam and Eve being removed from the garden of Eden. And that would, we would say is year zero. Praise the Lord. And so that would be the beginning of the mortal human race. 2,000 years later, God calls Abraham to father a special Hebrew race, amen, that would be called out from the rest of the human race, amen. And 2,000 years after that, Jesus came and fathered a new race called the sons of God, what we could call the church race, amen. And this race has eternal life in mortal bodies, amen. And these all three birthed and, su and were sustained by prophecy, by the Word of God. Why would we think he'd be doing anything different? Praise the Lord. Everyone came about the same way. It was prophesied, and then the people acted on it. Amen? And about 2,000 years later, Jesus is coming back to resurrect and translate this race into his immortal church race of people. Eternal people. No longer mortal, but immortal. Amen? And they're going to have eternal spirits in their new, eternal, immortalized, flesh and bone human bodies. This is the end of the last restorational movement and the one in which every Christian is going to participate. And us and all others will prophesy to usher it in. Praise the Lord. It said Jesus, when, when Jesus was born, it was in the fullness of time. Well, we think, okay, so X amount of years had to pass, or God had picked a date on a calendar somewhere. No, the fullness of time was when people began to declare the coming of the Lord. There were people that were prophesying the return of the Lord. Think about it. John the Baptist, that's all he was doing. Amen? Let me show you. Luke chapter 1 and verse 20. It's throughout the Bible, so I'm not making this up. I'm just telling you. I'm just giving it to you maybe in a little bit different way. But this is what he says in Luke chapter 1 and verse 20. Remember Zacharias, John the Baptist's dad? Behold, thou shalt be dumb and not be able to speak until the day that these things shall be performed, because thou believest not my words, which shall be fulfilled in their season. Amen. So Zacharias... He lost his speech for more than nine months because he doubted and he wouldn't say what God said. He wouldn't speak prophetically. He was only saying what he could see and what he could understand in the natural. Amen. But now look at Luke chapter 1 and verse 38. And Mary said, Behold the handmaid of the Lord. Be it unto me according to thy word. In other words, I'm agreeing with your prophetic word. And the angel departed from her. The angel brought her the word of the Lord, and, and she didn't say, hey, I can't believe this can't happen. She, she said, be it unto me, even as you have spoken. So she's, she's agreeing with the prophetic. She's prophesying the same thing that God had prophesied, right? Or on the other hand, so when the word of the Lord comes to Mary, she says what God said. Praise the Lord. And it happened, didn't it? Because she agreed. Now, had she not agreed, God had to look for somebody else. Somebody that would be in agreement with what he said. Amen? So, remember, Abraham, he didn't always feel like being, amen, uh, believing. We know he didn't because he deviated from what God had said. So we know he didn't always feel that way. But eventually he got to the point where he made a decision, I'm going to believe, regardless of what it looks like. Why? Because God gave him a prophetic word. 
You're no longer Abram. You're now the father of many nations. You're Abraham. And every time he opened his mouth, he was speaking prophetically in agreement with what God had told him. Amen? I'm telling you, church, when we start talking like God talks, we're going to start getting the same kind of results that God gets. When we start agreeing, we're going to see the miraculous. You can see, I mean, come on, John the, the Baptist, I mean, sure, uh, they were old just like, you know, uh, Sarah and Abraham. But all, uh, all uh, Zachariah had to do was say yes. It's going to happen. But he wouldn't. And what happened? His, he had nothing to share with anybody. Right? Because he wouldn't say what God said. God said, you're not saying anything. You're either going to agree with me or you're going to shut hell up. Right? And I think that's where we're at. The church is either going to start agreeing with God or people are just not going to listen. You might as well not have a voice if you're not going to say what God is saying. Now, I'm not anti-church. You know that. I'm just saying religion itself is going to have to make a shift here. It's going to have to change. It's going to have to start embracing what God has said and begin to declare that to the world around them instead of just to our little group who's in agreement with us. Amen. We've got to quit being so thin-skinned that it's just because somebody doesn't agree with me doesn't mean I can't share the gospel with them. Doesn't mean I can't still let them know how much God loves them. I don't need to get them to agree to every doctrinal issue that I may have. In fact, that's the last thing I need to be doing because they don't understand any of that anyway. What they need to know is somebody loves me and he's going to do whatever needs to be done to show me that love. And all I have to do is receive it. All I have to do is believe it. Amen. And the ultimate reception uh, to that love is salvation. But with salvation comes everything else. Healing and wholeness and prosperity and all the other things. Amen. That all people need. Amen. And so Romans 4 verse 13. Abram come to the place where he made a decision. Just like Mary did. Just like anybody in the Bible who's ever been used. They come to a place where they said it doesn't make sense. I don't get it. But I'm going to believe it because God said it. And that's all God's looking for. That gives glory to God. That shows him there's trust there. There's confidence. There's faith. Amen. And the just will live by faith. We haven't been living by faith and we haven't been very just either. We've been too religious, amen, to have to live by faith. All we've got to do is obey the rules. It's exactly what happened to Israel. And they missed the coming of their Messiah. I don't plan on missing this return. Praise the Lord. So, for the promise that he should be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. Amen? And we, being Christ, amen, then are we, Abraham's seed, and heirs according to the promise. That's what the scriptures tell us. This, this promise that he would be heir of the world, it didn't come through, through the work or through the religious activity, it came through simply faith. And God called that righteousness. Well, why are we the righteousness of God in Christ? Because we have faith in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. It's not my righteousness, but faith is given to me as righteous, or, or, or righteousness is given to me because of faith. Praise the Lord. That's how it has always worked. God hasn't got a different plan here. It's just the way we associate Amen. With it. Praise the Lord. Romans 10, verses 6 through 8. I like this. Praise the Lord. Romans chapter 10. Six, but the righteousness which is of faith speaketh on this wise. Say not in thine heart, who shall ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down from above, or who shall descend into the deep, that is to bring Christ up again from the dead. But what saith it? See, we're, we're trying to get this, it just, again, it's, it's like the, the parallel to Israel. They wanted their Messiah to come, but they didn't know what they were supposed to be doing to get it. And this is what he's dealing with here. Paul says, look, you're not going to go get Jesus and bring him down here for this second or the return. Or you're not going down there and bringing him back up. So what are we going to do? What saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart. That's the word of faith that we preach. How's Jesus coming back? When we start declaring it, when we start prophesying it, when we start speaking in agreement with God's word. Instead of trying to create another religion, let's just get the God, amen, to come. Praise the Lord. And so the righteous, which is of faith, righteousness, which is of faith, 
Jesus is not here physically. That's what it says. The righteousness which is of faith says, I look around, okay, Jesus isn't here physically. But the word is right here. So I can get everything that Jesus would give me by saying what the word says. Because that's all Jesus did. He said, I only say what I hear my father say. Right? That's what's in this book. Amen? It's the same word that created heaven and earth. Realize this. God's word is just as powerful as Jesus was when he walked this earth. Yes. Amen. You can't separate him from his word. God sent his word and healed them, the scripture says. Whether it was through Jesus or the promises of the new covenant. It works exactly the same. So this is the way we become heir of the world, heir of the promises, through the righteousness which is of faith, by simply believing. The same way you got born again, amen, is the same way you get everything that being born again brings. Your inheritance comes through the same way, amen. Romans 10, again, verses 8 and 9. But what saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth. Are you hearing this? Praise the Lord. If you'll confess with your mouth. If you'll say what God has said. That Jesus is Lord. You get saved. That's how you get saved. You believe in your heart. Or you exercise faith. And you confess with your mouth. And you get the promise. That's how everything works in the kingdom. And if we're going to have the kingdom operating here, we have to start believing in our heart and saying with our mouth the Word of God. Jesus and the Word of God. It's how we get saved. It's how we appropriate everything that God has planned, not only for us personally, but for the world as a whole. Amen? So we need to say, like the Scripture does, let your yea be yea and your nay be nay. Amen? Speak what you mean and mean what you speak. Praise the Lord. The word of promise is near you. Amen? First it's in your mouth, then it's in your heart. Praise the Lord. So, I'm getting ready to wrap up here, but speaking the end results is the method of calling things that are not yet. Amen? They're temporal. Everything in this world is temporal, so it's subject to change. So when we're, we're speaking the end results whatever it might be, it's simply the method of calling things that are not yet. Right? Well, Jesus is not yet here. But he's nigh to everyone who has a mouth to speak it and a heart to believe it. Amen? And it'll work. It'll work in and for us because we are the saints that Daniel prophesied this about. Amen? And the saints that John the revelator talks about. Amen? It, it'll work. It's God's creative power and prophetic word at work in and through his people. It's how it worked with Jesus. People say, well, he wasn't prophesying. Yes, he was. It's exactly what he was doing when he said, I only say what my father says. What's that? It's prophecy. It's being prophetic. It's agreeing with God's preordained plan. And that's where we need to be. Praise the Lord. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. Amen. In the visible as it is in the invisible. Praise God. You are the prophet of your own life. And by being the prophet of your own life, you become a prophet to those around you. Amen. Blessings and cursings are in your mouth. You can bless your neighbor or you can curse your neighbor. Amen. I've got a couple. <laughs> Praise the Lord. That I just have to be, not say anything because if I open my mouth, my nay may be nay rather than my yay being yay. Amen. We all know that. There's people that are just, you know, irritating. But we have to learn to just either bless them or keep quiet until you can. Amen. Jesus did the same thing. He, he would go away. I know sometimes he had to be really frustrated with his disciples because they just wouldn't get it. I mean, he, he'd show them over and over and over. And then the, the scripture says, and he would go away by himself. I imagine he did because he's probably thinking, my God, if I stay here another minute, I'm going to say something I probably wish I wouldn't have said. Now, I know I'm exaggerating here. This is Jesus we're talking about. But he was a man and he was tempted 
just as we are tempted. Now, I know I get tempted sometimes to say stuff that probably isn't the most productive when it comes to other people acting out. Amen. And I don't doubt that Jesus had the same thing. He just knew when to let's get away for a little bit and talk to God. Let's, let's hear what God has to say about this instead of my emotions. Amen. That's where we're at today. I know it's on the one hand, it can be fearful to think about the return of the Lord because you're thinking of loved ones. You're thinking of people who may not be saved. Listen, God is not going to let them be lost. It's not the will of God that any should perish. So if we'll just do our part, He'll open the doors. The Holy Spirit will lead us to people and in ways where we can impact them. We just have to remember, it isn't about getting them to do exactly what we did when we got saved. It's about getting them to just receive Jesus by faith. Amen? I'm not, I, I think people get saved in all sorts of kinds of churches, in all sorts of atmospheres, in different locations, in different surroundings. If it's real, it's real. I don't care where it happened. And neither does God. Amen? Yes, we'd like it to be in a church service, but let's face it, that isn't always the case. We've got, we've got, there's all kinds of multitudes of people that will never come to church. The moment you invite them to church, they freak. Because they had some experience at some point or heard something or whatever. And so you may not ever get them into the church. But we can get them into Jesus by sharing the love of God and letting them know that He's not a God of judgment and anger and hatred. He's a God of mercy and grace. And that's why He's extended this for as long as He has. But I do believe that we've been born for just a time as, as this. You know, we, we, there, there's a purpose for every season under heaven. God chooses people at a, for a certain place, a certain time to be born, and a certain time to live. We're here for that reason. I really believe that. And it isn't because we're special. It's because our God is special, and He has set the times and the seasons for us to operate in. And it's going to be powerful, and it's going to be glorious, because God is going to be the one that gets the glory. It isn't going to be some big ministry saying, yeah, look at me, send me a check. No, it's going to be God that gets the glory, because it's going to be just the everyday, common believers in Christ, the church that's going to have the impact, and they're going to do it one-on-one. -on -one. Yes. Nobody will be able to take the glory or get the credit. It'll, it'll, people will look back and just say, that was God. Yes. That church sat there for 30 years with 20 people in it. And all of a sudden, the whole city's turning to Christ. Mm -hmm. Amen? Yeah. Praise the Lord. It can happen. And it will happen because God, that's how He works. He looks... For the little things, the things that are not, to bring to naught the things that are. Yes. The inconspicuous areas. And Jesus, a nobody, born to a nobody, with a, with a kind of shady, uh, you know, background. He had prostitutes as grandparents. and I mean, he had all kinds of weird, you know, things going on in his genealogy. And then when he gets born, he's born in a barn, I mean, out in a stable. Somewhere in a little dinky town that nobody knew anything about or would avoid if they possibly could. And that's how God works. He takes the nothings to bring to nothing the things that think they are something. Amen? That's our God. And He gets the glory for it. I wouldn't have it any other way. Give the Lord a hand. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. God bless you all. Appreciate you being here. Appreciate your patience. Say what you mean and mean what you say. Speak in agreement with this word, and it shall come to pass, even as the Lord has said. Praise the Lord. I'm looking forward to exciting days ahead. Amen. God's got a time and a plan for us, and we all get to participate in it. And that's exciting. Amen. God bless you. Have a great week in the Lord. Stay cool and calm, and say what God says, and it'll all be good. Praise the Lord. You're dismissed in Jesus' name.